once you get that in place, then the rest of the mix just falls into place right behind it. What is going on? Welcome back to a yet another awesome episode of the Prolific Super Producer Podcast, where we are here to help you take that music you've got rocking in your bedroom and turn it into fully developed, finished songs that are ready to stream, that are ready to help you book gigs, that are ready to just help you take your music to where you want it to be. Ideally, here at this podcast, we're really talking about the professional career growth side of things. But hey, we always have a heart for if you're listening, you just want to be proud of the songs you're making. You just want to bump it in your car. All of the stuff I think will still be valuable to you, especially in these conversations that we're having today, because we're picking up where we left off in our previous episode, where we're really breaking down the six steps to create a pro song from scratch, like from the very beginning. So very briefly, what we covered in the last episode was just going through the beginning parts of the process. So songwriting, talking about lyrics and melody. We're talking about telling a good story. We moved on to producing where we were talking about, hey, we, when it comes to production, we want to keep things simple. We only want to do enough production to help tell the story that we started with our lyrics, with our melody, and that good song, good production will get out of the way of the song and let the story ring through, right? Then we moved on to recording. And really, Tyson was helping us like just remind us, hey, keep it simple, right? When it comes to recording, don't overthink it. You don't need the fancy gear. We talked about Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas making ocean eyes in their bedroom with about 400 bucks worth of gear. I think if you're listening to this podcast, you've probably heard of Billie Eilish, so I don't need to talk about what happened there. And we want to focus on vibe over quality, right? That taste really over technique can do a lot for you. You can get you really far. And so that kind of brings us up to speed where we are today, where we're going to be talking about the back end of things, the final few steps to really make this song, your song, the best that it can be to present it to the world in its best light. We're going to be talking about mixing, we're talking about editing, and we're going to be talking about mastering. And this is really Grandmaster Tyson's area of expertise. So I'm going to pass it over to you, man. We just kind of, you know, we'll just step our way through this to help people understand this polishing part of the process here. So I'm excited. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Before we dive in here, if you are interested in diving even deeper into some of this stuff around mixing and you really want to learn the fundamentals really well, because ultimately that's what's going to mean the the most to you long term in your mixing journey and mastering journey. If you want to just dive in on those, the most powerful techniques that I can possibly teach you, then I have created a free course just for that. And that is called the Pro Mix Formula. You can go get that at Pro Mix Formula. Formula.com. That will redirect you to the course where you can get it totally free. Just my gift to you to ensure that you can produce your music at a pro level without all of the just confusion that YouTube causes and all the tips and tricks. We just kind of cut through all of that. We just give you the real fundamentals that you need to know to produce your music at a pro level. With that said, let's dive into actually mixing and mastering. What is it? It's very confusing, especially if you're first diving into this. And so my goal with this episode is to keep it as simple simple as possible for you that you walk away from this understanding what it is and at a very high level what you need to do to get it done. Again, you can dive deeper on a lot of this other stuff. There's lots of great tutorials on YouTube and also that free course at promixformula.com. Dive into the, the actual concepts here that we're going to be discussing. Very first thing we need to cover, though, is what is mixing and what is mastering? A lot of times these are just shoved into the same category and mm. people aren't sure what is one versus the other is mix bus processing mastering or is it mixing? <laughs> and if you don't know what a mix bus is, then you're in the right place. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take the song that we've already produced in the steps that Nathan outlined, and we're going to make the best version of that song. And then ultimately, it'll be loud, it'll be clear, it'll be punchy and ready to release on Spotify and anywhere else that you want to distribute your song. There's two really distinct steps in this process to make that happen. And the first one is mixing. At a very high level, I like to view mixing and mastering as the personal trainer and the stylist. So mixing is the personal trainer. So your your song is the person that's coming to you as the personal trainer, as the mixing engineer. Then you need to basically get this person in shape. They're say say they're an actor and they need to get ready for a role. They need to just put on a ton of weight, right? They're they're kind of scrawny right now, but they need to gain 50 pounds in muscle before their next show in six months or whatever. We need to get them in shape. That is the mixing engineer's job or the personal trainer of the music world. We need to trim the fat, we need to build muscle, and we need to ultimately get them to a place where they're ready for that role. But before they can actually step onto the set to start filming that role, they also need a personal stylist, and the personal stylist is the mastering engineer. So we can't change anything about the person at that point in time. The stylist isn't going to be taking out chainsaws and hacking <laughs> off limbs. We're going to be, you know, putting some clothes on this person, maybe a little bit of concealer because 
they got a pimple on their on their <laughs> nose or something, right? We're going to be doing these small moves, but we're still going to emphasize what's already good about the person. So let's say they, they gained a lot of weight, but they also just have kind of like a spare tire type of thing around their middle because they overdid it with the protein and they just gained a little bit too much weight. Instead of giving them a really tight fitting shirt, like all the way down, very form fitting, you know, I might have a shirt that's kind of tight at the top, but kind of loose around the middle to mm. kind of hide some of their some of their flub there. So ultimately, that's what we're doing as a mastering engineer, I'm going to be emphasizing what's great about the mix and then de-emphasizing what's not great about the mix, coming up with a final product that is the best representation of what we've been given. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense of what the difference between mixing and mastering is to you and what our ultimate goals are with those. Let's talk more audio specific and let's go all the way back to the beginning now. And before we dive into mixing, there is one step that I kind of skipped over here and that is editing. Editing is the secret superpower of most professional producers. If you don't edit your tracks well, they, they will sound amateur regardless of how good of a mix or master you do. Editing is mostly focused on two things, focused on tuning and timing. First one is tuning. And so that is usually with your lead vocal, your harmony vocals, if those are out of tune with one another, they're going to sound terrible. Your song is going to fall flat before anybody can really enjoy any of the other creative elements that you added to the song. Because if the lead vocal is just out of tune, people just immediately get turned off and just want to leave. So that is a must. We need to tune our lead vocal. Even if you are an excellent singer, mm. there's always small things that you need to adjust to just nudge nudge that vocal in the right direction. So don't take it personally when a producer <laughs> is tuning your vocal or don't take it personally if you have to tune your own vocal. It doesn't mean you're a bad singer. Even world-class singers get their voice tuned in the production process. With tuning your vocal, because there's these people are my fellow kindred spirits, the artsy artists, right? Who are, no, it needs to be no auto-tune. I mean, auto-tune's a touchy subject. I mean, I feel, I feel like, right? Like, no, I want no auto-tune, all raw, all natural. And like, there's a flex and there's something about to be proud of that, right? I used to be on that side of things and what I can say about auto-tune, something that, you know, that I learned that just might be helpful, right? If you're like, no, I'm so against it. Auto-tune is, it can be a tool for efficiency as well. Like auto-tune can make tracking vocals and saving vocals much easier. And check this out. If you, like auto-tune can't do anything for your vocal performance, like how the expression, the tonality, like the way that you did your vocal take, if you have a really good take and you were so in it, that you were a little pitchy at a certain part because you're actually just feeling it. Auto-tune can be a great tool to save a really good vocal take just so it sounds a little more pleasant to the ear like Tyson is saying. And auto-tune isn't like a on and off switch, the plugin. It's not an on and off switch. Like you can, it's like a dial, right? Like you can dim the lights, you can turn them all the way up. You can adjust how intense the auto-tune is on your vocal. And if you want the T-Pain sounding, <laughs> you know, like thing, which is its own kind of style, right? But you don't have to go all the way there. You can just have sprinkle in a little bit to make it sound more professional and to save a really good vocal performance because you could be burning your voice out. Speaking from experience, you could be burning your voice out and, you know, trying so hard to get a perfect vocal take while feeling it, while having a good performance, while being on pitch. That's a lot. You know, that's a that's a pretty demanding task. A tool like Autotune, I just don't think it needs to be a, a hard no, I guess is what I would <laughs> want to throw in there, you know? <laughs> yeah. There, and there's also definitely a lot of plugins you could potentially look at using to tune your vocal. So there's a lot of mm. I, I prefer Melodyne personally because yeah. it, I have a lot more control over the vocal. So it's just like if one note is off, I can just move that one note in right. the right direction if they want a more natural sounding vocal without having to just auto tune the whole thing mm -hmm. necessarily. So there's lots of different options. Do a little bit of your own research on what's the best option for you. I would also kind of add on to what Nathan was saying is that if you have somebody come into your studio and you know they're either doing a feature on your song or you're just recording them for their song, make sure that that you're not pushing them beyond what they can do vocally because mm. I've made this mistake and I've burned vocalists out. And so I had to have them come back two or three weeks from them because they needed time to recover their voice because <laughs> yeah. I was like having them sing the last chorus that was really high like six <laughs> times and their voice yeah. just couldn't handle it. So I, I've only done that a couple of times, thankfully, but uh, <laughs> it is it is a terrible feeling when you realize you just ruined somebody's voice.
voice for the next two weeks. So make sure that you're, mm. you know, using the tools that you have available to be efficient and also create the best experience for anybody coming into your studio, whether that's again, whether that's a feature, whether that's an actual like client, if you will, mm. um, yeah. coming into your studio. A lot of these tools right that we're going to be talking about are really efficiency tools, not necessarily the magic tool to make your song mm -hmm. great. It's yeah. more just you can do a lot of this stuff manually. It's a lot of times just easier to reach for a plugin that can do it for you. Those are the one of the few premium plugins that I do recommend people invest in. Anything that makes you faster is mm -hmm. definitely something worth investing in because you're going to be able to just produce more music and do more of what you love rather yes. than the, all the things you hate, like editing your vocal. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> yeah. Leading into the second part of editing here is timing. So we've talked about tuning your vocal, but sometimes your vocal actually needs a lot of timing editing as well. What I would caution everybody is if you're going to be editing your vocal timing wise or any other instrument, honestly, stay away from anything that degrades your audio. Mm. And degrades your audio being all of the, the flex time stuff that generally is degrading your audio rather than keeping it intact. So essentially anything that's stretching or squishing your note is generally not a good thing to use. Instead, yeah. just go into your actual track and start chopping it and then moving it in the right spot. That's mm. going to get you way closer to what you want and with the least amount of artifacts being those little clips and pops inside of your audio as possible. That's what I would lean towards. And then also look up how to crossfade in your DAW because that's going to make your edits sound more natural because you won't have any clips and pops in between those little sections that you cut out. Basic as I can possibly make editing. Anything to add there, Nathan? No. I think that's really good. And I was guilty of using, you know, I'm a Logic user, so I was guilty of using flex time for vocals way back in the day. And I would always be like, it sounds like it's in time, but now it sounds like worse. <laughs> you know what I was be like, <laughs> why? And then yeah, I had to learn about artifacts, right? And it's, oh, okay, it's better just to chop and cut and write and like paste things and move things around until it really sounds right. And I think that's kind of the key with, you know, getting vocals in time. Like, yeah, use the grid lines for sure, like in your DAW to help you kind of like map out where you need to place them. But I also think there's something to be said for just not paying attention, just not even looking at the screen and like listening back to a vocal and just does it feel right. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's something for the the vibe artsy part of no, it just feels right, even if it's not mathematically on the yep. grid line. So one thing actually to that point uh, that I learned for all of you who produce rock music, anything that has electric guitars in it, it almost always sounds incredible. If you just take your entire electric guitar track and move it back mm. 10 to 20 milliseconds. And for whatever reason, it's just like that there's this magic spot somewhere in there that all of a sudden everything just like glues together. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it's that every single guitarist rushes their parts when they're playing <laughs> or it's just because it kind of it gets it out of the way of the drum transients. So those like the actual oh, spikes yeah. of the, the drum hits that it gets it out of the way. I think I think that's what it is. It's not that every guitarist is rushing, sure, but it kind of sure. gets it out of the way. And so it creates more of like this impact. It's really cool feeling and you just have to experience it to know it. Ninja. Um, just one of those things. All of you rock producers, try that out. A little pro tip for you for editing. I want to try that next time I got guitars <laughs> in a track. That sounds cool. <laughs> what do you think about uh, uh, plosives, Tyson? Like the I mean, you're probably hearing so much because I don't have a pop filter, but the yeah, you know, like how about that? For me, if I hear that in a vocal, maybe the average listener isn't as aware of this on a song just streaming on Spotify, right? They mm -hmm. could probably care less. But to like our ears, maybe like I'm hearing a plosive in a song and I'm being like, oh, that I don't know. I feel like it's like it can make a vocal sound a little more amateur. I yeah. don't know. A, a few years ago, I had to learn to like take out the plosives if there's a really big one, you know, that just blurred out something. So I don't know. Maybe that's like a conversation. What do you think? Like, I don't know if the average listener would care, but maybe nerds like us would care, you know? Uh, so like, what I, do you think? Yeah, I guess my feeling is that I do think it makes it sound amateur a little bit. And I think that most of the things that we're talking about, especially in this episode, most the mm -hmm. average listener isn't going to know about. That's They're not going to know if you, you know, used a de-esser on your vocal. They're not <laughs> yeah. going to know if you, if your vocal is a little bit out of tune. They're not mm -hmm. going to know if your drums are out of time, but they're going to be able to feel it. Yeah. And that's the key, right? If there's anything, any barrier in the way of them being able to experience the song for what it is, that's what we're fixing in this step. We're just removing all of that, like, noise and, and allowing the average listener to, like, really experience the song in the best way possible. I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but when you're using effects in your song, 
song, that can just get in the way of the actual song. If you're mm -hmm. using too many effects in your mixing process, it's going to just hide the actual true song that you have. And if you find yourself just adding more and more effects, oh, you yeah. might actually just have a bad song that you need to go back and fix the song Ooh, itself or it the is. recording is poor. Any yeah. prior step, you don't want to just cover up that work that you've already worked so hard to do. So mm -hmm. in my mixing style, I'm extremely natural in my approach because I just don't want to cover up the song that's already in front of me. I don't want to ruin somebody's song and cover up things that are actually good about it. That's Even good. if I personally don't agree with the creative decisions that were made, it doesn't sure. matter. Yeah, um, yeah. My job is to represent that song the best way possible. And so mm -hmm. by adding like infinite delays that like <laughs> go throughout the entire song, um, <laughs> it, it covers up a lot of stuff that is otherwise great about the song. So mm. just be really careful. If you find yourself adding more and more effects, it's usually because you did something wrong earlier in the mixing process or in the production process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really important. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on from editing here, and we're going to go on to actual mixing. So editing, I don't consider as part of the mixing process. It's very important and it can't be understated mm -hmm. how critical that is to do. But now that we've done editing, we're finally moving on to the fun part, which is mixing. There's a, a story that I like to tell about the very first stage of the mixing process. There was a basketball coach in the 60s and 70s who was very accomplished. And so just imagine yourself as a collegiate basketball player. You're a freshman. You just got recruited and you're very excited to, to start your collegiate basketball career. You get recruited to this school, you show up and you're at the first day of practice. And so you're, you know, you're shooting some hoops in order to get warmed up for the practice. And then the coach walks in, you're like, okay, here we go. Like we're going to learn some super <laughs> advanced, like awesome tips and tricks here. How to, how to just blow the competition away. He blows his whistle and he says, all right, line up on the baseline. And you're like, okay, you line up over <laughs> your baseline. You're looking, you know, to the sides and you're, you're seeing all your like collegiate upperclassmen buddies. And you're like, oh man, I'm legit now, <laughs> right? I'm a collegiate <laughs> basketball star. He does something very <laughs> unusual. The coach does. He, he goes to the side, he grabs, one of those plasticky chairs that you you know sat on in third grade puts it out in the middle of the court sits down and he's like all right lesson one how to tie your shoes so then he goes and proceeds <laughs> to take off his own shoes all your upperclassmen around you are doing the same thing and you're like is this some like weird freshman initiation thing or what's <laughs> yeah. going on but he remains completely very serious about this is explaining how to put on your sock and you know, rub the crease of the sock so it doesn't get bunched up in your heel and how to make sure that the pinky toe doesn't have a bunch up there that's gonna irritate your pinky toe while you're playing the game. And then how to put on your shoe and how to tie each, tighten your shoe at each ringlet to make sure that it's the perfect tightness all the way through, how to tie your shoe so it doesn't actually become loosened during the game. This is actually a true story. This is John Wooden was the coach. He was the coach at UCLA and he won the NCAA title 10 out of the 12 years he was the head coach. Why did he start every single season with how to tie your shoes? The reason is because he knew that how you do the smallest things in your mix, smallest things in the game, <laughs> are then going to translate to the biggest things you do as well. Mm. So if you do the smallest, the first things excellently, you will do the last things excellently as well. Everything builds on itself. If you can't tie your shoes properly, you're probably not going to have the same level of detail and attention the way that you do you know, your free throws or mm. dribble the ball or even running down the court. There's so many small things that by improving them incrementally, you're going to then improve your entire game or your entire mix as well. Hmm. Stepping, bringing that into the mixing, and I kind of already was like throwing it in there, but you understand the beginning stages of the mix are the most critical by far. And hmm. the first thing that you ever do inside of your mix is your volume balance. I'm a very firm believer that 90% of your mix is done in this stage. The very first 20 to 30 minutes, you should spend purely on volume balancing hmm. and volume balancing is just moving your faders up and down. You're not adding any plugins. Right. You're not doing anything but moving faders. Once you get that in place, then the rest of the mix just falls into place right behind it. So you don't have to use as many effects. You don't have to use as many plugins mm -hmm. because you've nailed this very fundamental first part. Anything to add there, Nathan? I just think this. I think that's huge. It took me way too long to figure that out. I was I was doing the 
exact same thing. Maybe a lot of people do. Like just, it doesn't sound the way I want it to, more plugins. It doesn't sound the way I want it to, more plugins on top of the more plugins. You know, like <laughs> just like trying to like compensate for the fact that like I wasn't starting with the basics because I just didn't learn the basics. I just assumed, oh, one of my favorite producers uses this plugin or it's a signature plugin by this famous, you know, mixing engineer. If I just slap that on, it's going to work. But volume balance, I love how you said that. That is, that's the bulk, 100%. And it's, I think, the most approachable too. You don't have to get stressed out about a plugin or learning it, or we're not even talking about EQ or compression and stuff like that. Like you're just talking about, hey, you've got your song there, take 30, 20, 30 minutes or whatever, and just dial it in. I don't know how you would explain this part, Tyson. I've always thought this is such a feeling thing where you're just moving things around. And I'm sure like there's some proper levels to set things at, but just, just trying to get the volume right. Like you just get to adjust and tweak things until it sits right. You know? So I feel like it's more approachable than people think. And it's easier than people think. And it could save you so much time if you're just reaching for plugins. No, just like move this fader and then move this yeah. other fader. And now how did those sound together? Okay. And then move, you know what I mean? Like, but that's the yeah. biggest part is the volume. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get I'll give like a, a quick like 30 second recap on how to do this properly in your Let's mix. Go. When you sit down to mix, right, you have all of your tracks, they're all clean, you know, they're edited, all of that stuff, right? Make sure your session is clean and organized before you actually begin mixing. But once you're at that stage, you're ready to volume balance. And so the first thing that you want to do is to take all of your faders down to zero. So there's no sound coming out of your DAW. Then you want to take the most important element in your mix and then move that up to basically zero or you know somewhere around there. And then you want to bring up all of your other elements to in relation to that one thing. So say your snare is the loudest thing in your mix. And another thing to use is references in this stage. References mm, are incredibly helpful yep. in being able to get a good volume balance. So pick a reference that you think sounds good, relatively similar to your song, and then <clears throat> use that as the baseline for your volume balance, because that's going to get you really, really close really fast. And then use this technique of moving everything down to zero, moving up the most important element. So say your snare, and then I'm going to move up my kick drum next. My kick drum is maybe just a little bit quieter than my snare, and I'm just going to I'm just going to feel it. I'm going to wait until it feels like the kick drum is moving in front of the snare and then I know it's too too mm -hmm. loud then I'm yeah. going to move it back. So I like to use another analogy of a baseball diamond. So imagine that you are the umpire in a baseball diamond and all of the players sitting outside are the elements inside of your mix. And then think about which elements do I want to be closest to me? Like who's going to be the catcher essentially, <laughs> right? That's going to be the loudest <laughs> element. And then who's going to be the pitcher? Who's going to be, you know, the the first and third baseman? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I don't know baseball very well, so uh, <laughs> this is now just breaking down. But the point is, you, you think about your mix that way of who's close to me, who's far away, and then volume balance accordingly. Every single time I've taught somebody this, their volume balance comes back a hundred times better. It's, mm. it's incredible. But just thinking about distance is the way that I would approach most volume balance, especially when you're first starting, because everybody understands that. Something further away is quieter, something closer to you is louder. And so by putting that into a sphere, separating the whole thing of, okay, I'm just like sitting in this room with two speakers, it's kind of weird. Closing your eyes, thinking about a more natural sounding space and thinking about where those elements should belong into each other. And then the last tip that I have for you is that when you're volume balancing, do not listen to the thing you're changing. So if mm. I'm bringing up my electric guitars, I'm not listening to my electric guitars. I'm listening to my snare and my kick drum. That's big. Because when I am listening to a specific element, like a piano or my electric guitars in this case, I'm going to turn them up too loud because mm. I want to hear them. But yeah. if I'm listening to the other elements in my mix, like my, say, my kick drum, and then I can't hear my kick drum anymore, I know I've brought my electric guitars up too loud because it's covering that element up. And I know that I want that element to be in the front, which is why we go front to back inside of our volume balance. Mm. Hopefully those those are really helpful for you. Go back and like re-listen to that because honestly, those are the most powerful tips I can possibly give you when you're volume balancing and it will help you in your mix. 100%. I honestly think, and I know this to be true, especially because we're talking people who are super producers, right? You're doing everything. So you're coming, you're doing your own production, which means you're doing your own sound selection, sound recording. I think if you just paired solid sound choices, solid sound sources that are well recorded, that sound good, 
good, even if it's samples or whatever, but they're just solid. They sound great. And then you just worry about volume balance. I think those two alone, honestly, like I think would get you just about all the way home. Yep. Yeah, just, especially from just a typical listener perspective, just streaming on Spotify. Like if you just had good sounds paired with good volume levels, I think that could do a lot. So, and yep. I know that to be true because, you know, one of my songs that went on to like close the season finale of Grey's Anatomy, that song has no effects on it. It's all volume balance. And it was me referencing a song that I, that I thought I could try to emulate like the sonics of. I was just volume because I didn't know anything about effects yet. I was just making stuff, but I chose good sounds and I spent my time volume balancing, referencing a professional song. It was, it was good enough, right? Like someone chose it and it was on national television. So like, I just think you just can't over, you can't overthink it. You know what I mean? So in a sense, if it sounds good, it sounds good. And it's more often much simpler than we make it out to be. The best mixing engineers in the world use half as many plugins as anybody else. It's all just those tiny moves that make the largest differences. Yeah. And to, to kind of go on that too, I like to view mixing as a pyramid. Uh, I know I have several pyramid analogies that I've already <laughs> talked about, but this is a yet another pyramid <laughs> yeah. analogy. Again, you, we think about a pyramid, the base layer of our pyramid in our mixing pyramid is volume balance. We've talked about that. We've we've iterated that enough that volume balance is the key to a great mix. And so once you have your volume balance, then you can move on to the next stage, which is really the sonic balance, which is related to the volume balance. But ultimately, it's driven by EQ. So those EQ decisions you make, you're going to mm. boost at the 1K range on your guitars. Like that's going to impact your EQ in your overall sonic quality of your song. That is the second most important thing that you do, building relationships between the elements in your mix. And then the next level is going to be compression. So compression is less important than EQ, but still relatively important to ensure that your your mix sounds modern. If you're using samples like Nathan was just mentioning, a lot of those are already compressed. So you don't need mm. to add additional compression to those. So be really careful about what elements you have in your mix and what you actually need stuff. Don't add anything just because you can or just because you think you should. Make sure that you're adding it for a specific reason. That's compression. And then the very last, very top of your pyramid is effect. It's the very last 1% of your mix that's going to add that little tiny, you know, flavor that is going to be really nice, your song, and for people to get all wild about when that, yeah, that little <laughs> delay comes in. When, and I think, right, most people would start at, we, they, do the, they flip the pyramid. We start with right. effects. And then we're, What's the first yeah. thing you do to your vocal? Oh, you, reverb and delay, baby, all yeah, day long. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or distortion, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, those things can be really powerful and really helpful in your mix, but just recognize yeah. that that is the last one percent. Mm -hmm. It's not the majority of your pyramid. So, um, and approach it from that way. I always teach all of my students to approach it from the volume first, then EQ, then compression, then effects. The reason why we do that is because we want to get the biggest gains first, and then yeah. we work our way up. Yeah, you can be super creative with your effects. The majority of your mix is still made in those first two steps. Last thing about mixing before we move on. When you're mixing, I've already discussed that mixing is a game of trying to emphasize what's already great about your song. To put that into more practical terms, when you're mixing, think about each section of the song as you go through. Think about what is the main element that people are going to latch onto in this section. Hmm. And it could be a section being like two beats when a counter melody line comes in. Mm. Or it could be the entire verse when the vocal is singing the whole time. Or it could be, you know, just like a fill when the drums come in and are working on, you know, a transition into the chorus or something. There's all of these tiny moments that you want to be able to emphasize instead of your mix. And so your mix shouldn't be static. It should be moving all of the time throughout the entire song. First, you're going to want to get a good static mix you know, essentially where you don't have any automation, nothing's changing in volume throughout the whole thing. You want to move into this place where you're making sure that each element is going to be emphasized where it shines best. When you have, you know, your lead guitar come in, make sure you can hear the lead guitar and it's prominent in the mix and it's probably in the center as well because people need you to direct them as the mixing engineer. Remember, we're going, you're the personal trainer, you tell them, you <laughs> yeah. know, what exercise to do. That analogy doesn't really work, but yeah. <laughs> you get the point though yeah. that telling them to like pose certain ways to like make sure that they're, oh, they're looking at the arm now. Yes. Oh, now they're looking at your butt or I don't know. Yes. <laughs> um, it, the point is to emphasize what's great about that song at that very specific moment, not just overall in broad sweeping terms, because a lot of people get really lazy by the end of the mix. And I'm guilty of this too, about not actually going through the song and really thinking about what a listener's going perspective is going to be and what I want the listener to listen to. You need to direct them to what you want to them to listen to. Otherwise, mm. they might miss things that are really cool about the song. 
Moving on to mastering. So far, we've talked about editing, making sure your tracks are tuned and timed properly. Before we move on to the mixing process, we've talked about mixing where your volume balance is 90% of your mix and then EQ, then compression, then effects at the very little tippity top there. Mastering is where you've now have a finalized mix, you've exported that and you have a single file that you're going to then master. And this is where most people get really confused. They're like, oh, what do mastering engineers do? Do they have like special gear? Do they you know, have this like special like analog tape machine that you know adds this, this magical totally vibe to make it mastered this is totally me yeah <laughs> <laughs> but in reality we use the same exact tools that we've already used in the mix to master the song as well boom and it is much much simpler than people like to make it out to be and i think there's a several different reasons for this i think the number one reason why mastering is kind of shrouded in mis like mysterious dark clouds is because <laughs> mastering engineers don't like to talk to people. They sit in their studios all day long mastering songs <laughs> and they might have an intern at one time in their career, but ultimately they're just hermits and they don't <laughs> like to talk to people. They don't have people coming into their studio. Mm. They're just mastering all day. So that's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I was just more of like a selfish curiosity now, but maybe someone's wondering it. So I know with like mixing engineers, it can be pretty common for the artist to sit in right? Like on the mixing session or, you know, something like that. And there can be some back and forth there. Is that not typically the case with mastering engineers where it's really usually an artist or, or like the mixing engineer wouldn't be sitting in on the mastering thing? Like it's, it's usually it's secluded. It's like its own thing. I'm just kind of curious. I'll let you in on a little secret. <gasps> it is, it is true that it's not very common to attend your mastering sessions. Yeah. Some mastering engineers allow you to, if you really want to. Okay. So that is an option, but it's not very common. The reason being, or one of the reasons being, a typical master will take between 10 and 20 minutes to complete. Whoa. It's a very fast process if you know what you're doing. Mm, okay. And so this is the reason why mastering engineers are a little bit protective of a lot of their stuff because mm. I think a lot of mastering engineers are just frankly afraid that somebody else is going to figure out how easy mastering is to do <laughs> once you learn it. And yeah. then they'll be out of a job. Uh, okay. I think that's part of it. And I, I might be oversimplifying it too because I am a mastering engineer. And so it is simple to me, but it's probably mm. not simple to everybody. Sure, so yeah. that is probably one thing that I'm a little bit biased towards. But at the same point in time, I was able to go from Jim being an, an all like full stack producer, doing all the production, all the mixing and all the mastering mm -hmm. to then specializing in mastering within six months of quitting my day job because yeah. I figured that section out figured really out. well. Yeah. So it's not impossible to learn rapidly and actually then go out and do really well in the industry if you mm. if you get the right training and the right knowledge um, right, right. to do that. Because you are also only spending about 15 minutes per master, how, how much a typical master costs is, you know, probably around a hundred dollars for okay. a professional mastering engineer yeah, for sure and so the actual dollars per hour you can earn as a mastering engineer is very high mm. so if you ask me to master your song like i can earn up to 300 400 dollars an hour mastering yeah. your songs wow. granted that doesn't include all the back and forth like emailing and all of the you know revision process sure, and all of that okay. stuff because that can you know eat up a lot of time but perfect world right you can earn a ton of money per hour as a mastering engineer so step take a step back you're not paying a mastering engineer engineer for their time. Mm. You're paying a mastering engineer for their, for their expertise. Yeah, right. Okay. I like using the analogy of there's this there's this factory back in the day it was uh, Henry Ford and he had his original factory built and it was running great. And then all of a sudden, one of their critical machines breaks down and it stops the entire production line. They're bleeding thousands of dollars an hour, you know, back in 1915 <laughs> or whatever. Then he calls in the, the expert to come in and fix the machine. So the contractor walks in, he sets down his tool bag, takes a look at the machine, you know, he listens to it. And then he takes out a hammer out of his tool bag and he taps it just a little bit in one specific spot. Sets it down, turns on the machine, everything's rolling. And they're like, okay, uh, great. Thanks for helping out. Like, can you send us an invoice? And so he's like, yeah, it's going to be 10 grand. And they're like, 10 grand? Like, you spent about five minutes here. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. And then, the, and then they said like, okay, like, whatever. Just give us the invoice, but we want it broken down into separate parts of like what you did, right? They're yeah, like, yeah. Trying to, let's pull a fast one on him. Yeah. So he sends them the invoice and it says hammer <laughs> rental $1. <laughs> Knowing where to hit the machine with the hammer, $9,999. <laughs> I love that. That's a great analogy. Yeah. So 
don't assume that just because somebody doesn't spend time with you or with your song yeah. or that thing doesn't appear to be that much effort or work doesn't mean it's not valuable because ultimately mm. your song is going to be that much better if you have somebody mastering it who knows what they're doing. Just because I've let you on the, the dirty secret of mastering doesn't mean it's still not <laughs> valuable to hire a true mastering engineer because otherwise you're you're not able to get that level of quality. Yes. Granted, I also teach people how to master their own music. So I, I think it's a it's a skill that's 100 percent replicable by the average producer and average super producer. Mm. But you also just need to learn that information somehow. And if mm. you don't know it, then I would ha- seek out a professional mastering engineer for your song. But gotcha. That being said, it's also more valuable to have a good mix. So if you're like right, split between point. the decision of like hiring a mixing engineer versus hiring a mastering engineer, I would go hire a mixing engineer every single time. Although mm. mastering all in all is usually not that expensive per song. Yeah. So like my my rates are at least right as of the filming of this is around $95 <laughs> a song. So if you're terrified of the cost, it's really not that bad. Comparatively to a mixing engineer is going to charge you minimum Could probably be, $200 yeah, per right, song. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah. And, and upwards of, yeah, 1000 or if you're uh, Chris Lord Algae, then you charge 25k <laughs> per song to Nuts. mix. Yeah, you he does, and he's two a day. He does two, two a day, so he's earning 50 grand a day mixing. Dude, CLA man, oh my goodness. So here's the thing, because I'm sure this is a common. Again, this was I fell victim to this too. Just like you can fall victim to effects will save my song or effects will save my mix. Also, mastering will save my mix. I've definitely fallen for that. Oh no, it's actually not the mix. Like the mix is a cool, you know, we got to kind of you know tweak some things, but it's really the master. Like we get the master back that our song's really going to sound good. And so could you sp- maybe just take like, I don't know, a couple minutes to speak to that covered it, but just to really like drill that home that mastering is, is important and it, it absolutely is a part of the process. That's why it's one of the six steps, right? But mixing is really the meat and potatoes. That's, that's the substance that's actually going to do the heavy lifting of making your song sound pleasing, right? Sound good and enhanced. Would you say it's like the cherry on top or would you say it's little, little more than that? I would say it's the stylist. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <No>. uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I, I think there's actually something to that because if you've ever seen those articles I'm sure everybody's like clicked on one at some point in time but of the difference between especially female actresses without makeup and then oh, with makeup yeah, yeah, dramatic yeah. difference it's, right yes, like yes, that yes. is that is mastering right there so okay I like that the there's some good bones to it if there's no like good bones to your mix master's not going to help that um, but if there's okay. good bones to your mix then mastering is going to do one it can, do a, it can do a good bit, yeah. And so the thing that I always tell everybody when they're thinking about getting a master, they're not necessarily confident with their mix. Mastering is going to do two things. It's going to make your song more polished, but it's also going to bring out every single mistake that you've ever made in the mix. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I can I can try to de-emphasize certain things, but it's going to come at the sacrifice of it's going to bring out other things that you probably didn't want. Any mistake that you've ever made from the the you know songwriting process all the way through is going to yeah. be brought out during the mastering process. You know I've mastered songs for people and then I give that give it back to them and then they decide they're like oh well it sounds better but it also <laughs> I'm really disappointed because now I recognize all the mistakes that I've ever made inside yeah. of this mix and then they feel like they need to go remix the song before they send it to me again. That's a very very common gotcha. thing to encounter and so if you're not confident with your mix seek out that feedback to help you get in the right direction first. One thing that I've always done as a mastering engineer and one reason why I actually started getting a lot of gigs really fast in my career was that I always give feedback on the mix before I master it. Mm. So that very first iteration, I'm very cognizant of getting all of the feedback possible that I think is going to improve the song. Yeah. And then I've had songs that come in that sound kind of like crap. Yeah. And then I <laughs> give them the feedback and then they and then through one or two iterations, it's a completely different song by the end of that process because they're either just like a really amateur mixer, they're just not sure exactly what they're doing. And so sure. just a few small changes is really going to level up the mix and then ultimately make the master a lot better too. Mm. In my in my experience, mastering is more about quality control than necessarily about the mastering skill itself because gotcha. your job is to ensure that everything that comes out of your studio is at a top quality level or at least as high as possible with the budget that be given. Sure. So by giving feedback and making sure that the song is actually ready for mastering, you're ultimately going to end up with a much better product. And so that's honestly the majority of my job. It's not really mastering. It's giving people feedback on their mixes to ensure that they're ready 
ready for mastering so mm -hmm. then I can master their song and then they can get a great result from it. A lot of mixing engineers that I've talked to really lament that fact that their mastering engineer doesn't actually give them any feedback. And mm -hmm. I was that same way too. When I was starting to hire mastering engineers for my own music, yeah. I always... I always ask them like, "Hey, can you leave, like give me some give feedback me some on feedback. this song, on this mix?" Most of the time, it would be like one or maybe two sentences. We're like, "Oh yeah, your bass is kind of loud," or you know, "Your guitars <laughs> are too loud." Thanks. Like, appreciate the detail. Yeah. <laughs> so having that detail was just one thing that I knew from the artist perspective. I'm like, I always wanted that, and so I am always very cognizant when somebody hires me to master. I'm always giving them that feedback because I know how invaluable it is from that outside perspective, especially somebody who is a professional in the audio community and industry. Okay. I feel like I've just been sitting here selling my mastering services. <laughs> <laughs> now everyone go uh, hire Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, all that being said, let's talk about mastering as a skill just to give you some helpful tips on how to actually go and do this for your own music really quick here at the end. There is a lot of confusion around loudness standards because that's a lot of mastering is making things loud and also making them sonically balanced. I'm going to tell you right now that it's way more important for your song to be sonically balanced than to be loud. And ironically, making your song more sonically balanced will automatically make it louder. The reason being is that humans don't hear every fre single frequency the same loudness. Our perception of, of various frequencies is skewed, and that's actually skewed towards the mid-range. So anything between 1 kilohertz and 5 kilohertz is perceived as the loudest frequencies that we can hear. It's because babies cry at that frequency. So when you hear a baby cry, you immediately know, and it's kind of annoying to you because as a parent, right, you need to be able to go take care of your child. Yeah. But everybody, we're, it's just ingrained in us as humans to hear that frequency louder than everything else. And I think it's for that reason. Regardless of the reason, that's the truth, <laughs> is what we, we perceive that as louder. By ensuring that that is well balanced with the low and high end as well, it's going to allow our song to be as loud as possible without sacrificing any actual like just dynamics because mm. I can shove something into a limiter and just squash the whole song <laughs> and it'll be a little bit louder, but it won't be as loud as if I did the same thing with a sonically balanced song. Mm, so that's big. all things being equal, a sonically balanced song is always going to be louder than a not sonically balanced song. Oh no, my camera just died. Oh, it's your faceless weird W. Um, <laughs> Can teach you how to master. Let me define sonically balanced for everybody. So a sonically balanced song is something that roughly matches pink noise. So pink noise is a, a synthetic noise that has every single frequency has the same exact energy. So if you want mm. your song to be sonically balanced, take a pink noise sound in your mastering session, play that, look at that on an analyzer, so a frequency analyzer, and then look at your song and see the differences. Mm. Uh, another way to do this is using match EQ and just like see yeah. what the differences are. These are not going to be a perfect one-for-one -one representation of what you should be doing in your master, but it will move you in the right direction. I also do this for my mix bus inside of my mixes as well because you know basically the master master channel in your right. mix and so because that that will again guide everything in the right direction before the mastering process to make mastering the mastering process even easier to do for your mastering engineer and ultimately end up with even better results for your master so mm. that's that's the 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 tip that I have for you on getting a, a sonically balanced song. You can also use references, but I lean away from that and just in case the reference isn't necessarily sonically balanced either. Oh, that's a good point. And then the, the very last point I have is make it as loud as you need to to get the vibe you want. Loudness is about vibe. It's not about just physical loudness. Some people will look at the Spotify standards and say, oh, yeah. I'm not supposed to master it above this certain, you know, like minus 12 dB in RMS or whatever. That doesn't matter, just ignore that. Because mm. if you, ha loudness increases the harmonics inside of your master. And so it's a fancy way of adding, of saying there's more noise added. <laughs> the more you compress your master, the more of those, of that noise is added to the mix, it's going to change the vibe of your song. And so make it as loud as you need to, to add the vibe you want without overdoing it or underdoing it. Because if you underdo it, then your song isn't, it's just gonna lack this certain like quality of added saturation and distortion that isn't going to sound professional versus mm. if you go too much it's going to add too much of this distortion and it's then going to 
be perceived as just gritty, dirty. Sometimes you want that, like if it's a metal song sure. or something, like yeah. that, that could be pleasing. Most of the time you want to land somewhere in the middle. Just as a general rule of thumb, if you're aiming for a certain amount of luffs or RMS, then I would aim for between minus 10 and minus eight. That's usually the sweet spot somewhere in there, mm. leaning towards the minus eight for louder songs, leaning towards the minus nine or minus 10 for more acoustic driven songs. Okay. So that's just a general rule of thumb. Don't take that for gospel, but because I've mastered songs all the way up to like minus four and a half luffs, which is <laughs> right insanely on. loud. <laughs> and then songs around that minus 11 as well for just really chill vibe. And ultimately the value of Spotify is it's gonna normalize all of of those stuff so it's not going to appear to be louder or softer than any other song right. as long as our our sonic balance of our master is spot on mm. so that is mastering in a nutshell for you hopefully that makes sense to you some of that might get a little bit advanced if you're not familiar with what mastering is and that process but hopefully that gives you the just basics to work off of when you're going into your own session love that i think it's great and i think it's such a it's good to talk about it too because it's such a mysterious process i don't know it's like that thing that i don't it's easy it's like easy to get your head around mixing right okay here's all my individual tracks and let's orchestrate them and put them together so that they all the sounds sound good and sound good you know and all together but then I don't know, to try to get to the point of, okay, mastering, but there's like this other thing to do too. I don't know. I think a lot of people just stay mysterious about it. Maybe they don't even want to take the time to learn about it. It feels too confusing. So they'll just always pay someone else. And I think what's encouraging, you know, what to take home, you know, if you're listening and you're making songs by yourself is you could absolutely learn how to do this stuff. And maybe that doesn't mean you're always mastering your own things or whatever, but like if you're trying to save money and you're just trying to like put your music out and finish things, you can absolutely learn how to do this yourself. And you can learn, you know, even just rewind and just listen to some stuff that Tyson was saying and maybe more importantly, go ahead and get your hands on some of his free stuff so that you can learn how to do this process. And so you can get more comfortable with it. You know, I really appreciate appreciate you breaking that down. I was even learning some things too, because, you know, I'm one of the people who learned how to do it, you know, but that doesn't mean I'm amazing at it or anything. It's just, okay, I can get the job done. But Tyson's actually like legit, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's really good to hear your end and to even hear you as the, the, the legit pro. This process really isn't, it doesn't need to be as crazy as people make it out to be in their heads. So I, that was a big takeaway for me. So I appreciate you breaking that down, man. Well, we sure hope that this was helpful for you. And you got plenty of gems to take away. We know that these kind of last few episodes were really just trying to spend some time on each step of the process to making songs in your bedroom. We want to try to do it justice, but you know, we're trying to keep these episodes condensed, but even in this time frame, we can't cover everything, right? There's always more that you can learn, but we are trying to give you the meat and potatoes. And if you'd like a guide, something that can help you walk through just getting a song done, that is where I want to direct you to a site called finishsongsguide.com. It's just a free guide that I put together after, you know, years of just struggling with getting songs done. You know what I mean? Like I was repping out an album a year or something, like 10 songs a year for the longest time. And I was fed up with that. I had more songs sitting on my hard drive in demo, you know, like sketch V1, demo two or whatever. I didn't have as many songs streaming or as many songs that I could play for friends or family or even just for myself to be proud of. I had to change my workflow. I had to learn how to get more songs done in less time less writer's block and just learn how to finish something. So if that's you, if any of that resonated with you, it's free. It's, it's totally free. It's just a PDF. It's like 10 pages. You can just take it, print it out if you want to, keep it on your phone. You can reference it as you're trying to make songs from start to finish in your bedroom. So we appreciate you. And all of course, we would really appreciate if you could leave a comment here, give us a review so that you can let us know, you know, what you're enjoying about this. And of course, we'd love to know, hey, is there anything that could we go deeper on? You know, is there something that, oh no, I, that really struck a chord with me. I'd love to learn more about this specific thing. We would absolutely love to cover that for you and do anything and everything we can to be your big brothers or your little brothers, however you see us. Um, and one other thing that I want to add, guide that Nathan just told you about, add the fact that Nathan walks the walk. He doesn't just give free guides away that don't actually mean anything. He actually told me he finished 85 songs this year. If you think about that, that's one song every three days. So what could you do if you finished every some, one of your songs every single three days this year or next year? You'd have so much material out there. There's You'd be able to have songs for decades, potentially, <laughs> be able to be released in the future. If you want to finish that many songs, though, make sure you pick up that guide. Thanks again for watching, and we will catch you in the next episode of The Super Producer Podcast. Prolific Super Producer Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I did it again.